So I want to move on to this section this week. And again, I've got a lot that I'd like to get through, so we'll see whether I manage to do it or not. This week's lab now is the first in a, a series of four labs. And in that series, what we will be doing is incrementally building a React app, which is based on talking to a web API that contains lots of information about movies. So we'll be rolling that out over the next four weeks. And then in terms of assessment, what we will ask you to do is to take what we finish up with after those four weeks and build on it some further. Uh, I can talk more about that um, when it gets closer towards the end. And uh, there's a fairly significant archive with this week's lecture as well. So let's work our way through the slides. Now, we know from last week how to uh, implement an app, uh, or sorry, a component, I beg your pardon. Uh, we're going to move on to the app level at this stage, although we did an app as well, maybe in the second of last week's labs. But uh, the main focus was on a component. But the problem with the components that we were developing was that they were static. There was no dynamics in them. And that's going to all change this week because there's a lot more to the component model uh, that we need to look at, and we won't cover it all this week either. So here's the plan for today. I want to talk about component state, and uh, this is the other part of a component's data model, if you like. Last week, we looked at props, which were passed into a component state is the other part of a component's uh, data model, and it's this state concept that is what's going to allow us to make a component dynamic or interactive. Secondly, then we're going to talk about how data flows within a, an app. We know, or at least I stated last week, that a, a React app is always going to be a hierarchy of components. And it turns out that data can only flow in one direction in that hierarchy. Then I'll move on to talk about uh, something called hooks, which was only introduced into React around 2019, uh, but they're there for good now, really. And we also will be looking at hooks throughout the, the remainder of my part of this module. I look at some of the hooks today with other hooks we will come across, mainly as we work our way through the labs. And the hooks kind of impact on a component's life cycle, I'm saying there. So they kind of influence the life cycle of a component somehow. Finally, uh, I'll talk about something called the virtual DOM. That will be quite a short section at the end. So component state. And component state is related to a component's data. And as I was saying there a moment ago, uh, there are two parts to a component's data or it's two sources for its data. One we know about, which is props. And we know that props are passed into a component from another component, typically. Um, Props are immutable. And a lot of people say that essentially what a component is, is it renders props onto the screen. Uh, but that's just by the way. So they're passed in and they're immutable. State is the second part. And state is kind of everything that a prop isn't. They're the kind of opposites of each other. State is data that is managed internally by a component. So it's kind of private to it. If you, if you like. And the thing is that if a component changes the value of a state variable of one of its state variables, then automatically the React runtime will re-execute that component, or as we say, it re-renders the component. And in the re-rendering, more than likely, what the component wants to display has changed. Hence, we've got a dynamic component. It is changing. Uh, typically as a result of the user interacting with it, but it doesn't have to be, that, that doesn't have to be the source of the, uh, that doesn't have to be what triggers the change. So this idea of uh, components having internal data, which we call state, they can have local variables, ordinary local variables as well, but state is something slightly different. And if a component changes uh, one of its state variables, then automatically, that component is going to re-execute or re-render. Uh, 
And as I said, it's the, oh yeah, so I'm just saying there that whether it be props or state, the, the, the structure of the data can be anything you want it to be. So maybe a prop or a state variable might be a primitive, it could be an object, it could be an array, it can be as trivial or as complex as you want it to be. There are no restrictions. Something I didn't mention last week, um, I'll just briefly look at them today, but they're not that significant, but sometimes, um, you know, so quite often you develop components uh, that are used by maybe either other people on your team or by somebody outside of your organization, you might open source components. And you always have to be careful that other people use your components in the way that you would like them to use them. And if they don't, then your components still kind of can deal with the situation. In particular, I'm talking about if a component that you develop, develop expects to receive certain props, and for whatever reason, somebody that uses your component doesn't pass in some of those props into it, then is it possible for our component to assign some default value to the props so that at least it has some value and the component doesn't crash as a result? And we'll see how to do that programmatically. It's not very clean syntax, but we'll see how to do it anyway. Also, there may be, there, there more than likely will be some sort of type uh, requirement on the props that are passed into a component. So we, is it possible to do some sort of type checking on the props that are passed in and warn, not so much the user, but the developer, if they are using a component incorrectly. And we'll also see how to do that programmatically. In relation to state, so a state, we said a state variable is internal to a component. So how do we initialize a state variable? It's, as I said now, a state variable is gonna be slightly different from an ordinary local variable that you might declare inside the component. So that there has to be a special way of initializing it. Uh, and there also, as it turns out, would be a special way of mutating or uh, changing a state variable. So we need to look at all of these. And again, I want to reiterate the fact that uh, when you change a state variable, automatically the React Runtime Engine will re-render or re-execute the entire component code from beginning to end. Um, now, this isn't that significant. Uh, I'm saying that when you change a state variable, you effectively perform an overwrite of the state variable. The only reason I'm mentioning that is because uh, in earlier versions of React, when you change the state variable, the, the, the change was more of a merge operation than, no, than an overwrite operation. But that's just by the way. Let's look at the kind of 101 example. So on the right there, I'm showing you by way of a diagram, uh, I'm representing this very simple component that I've developed and we look at the code. And the component, what I'm trying to get across here is that the component has a state variable, which is a type integer and its initial value, we want to set it to zero. This component expects a prop, which I've called jump, which is also going to be an integer value. Uh, the component is going to have a button and that's going to allow the user to interact with it. And what we want to happen is every time the user clicks the button, we want the state variable to be incremented by whatever the value of jump is. Okay, now this particular component, you can, it's actually was available to you from last week. So if we go back to the basic React lab that we had last week, which is, uh, where is it? Here it is here. And if we dig down into this sample here, so here's the component and I look at the code in a minute. And if we look at the stories related to it, So I have three stories for this particular component. Here's one story where I actually don't pass any prop to my component. So hopefully within the component, I have a way of dealing with that. In other words, I can assign a default value to it. Here's the normal kind of case where I just call the component with a particular jump value. And I'm actually also illustrating calling the component where the prop that I pass to it is the wrong type and pass it a string instead of an integer. 
Uh, by the way, there's a small error in the code that I gave you. And the error is, let's see, um, basic normal. Yeah, the error is here. It should really be exceptional. Yeah. Okay. Let's start the. Uh, let's start the server. Sorry, the storybook. And the only one we're interested in is this one down here. So if we look at the normal case, the normal case is where we passed in the prop. And um, what my, we'll look at the component code in a second, but what you're gonna see now is every time I click my button here, you know, uh, the component is changing, okay? All that's changing is this here, but it is changing. So it is re-rendering every time. So let's look at the actual component code. And the key part is here. This is how we declare a state variable. So there's a special function called useState, and that's coming from React. You can see it up here. So useState is the function that you use to declare a state variable. The parameter that you pass to it is the initial value that you want to give to that state variable. So because we're giving it a zero, it looks like it's going to be an integer. And what it returns is an array or a tuple, as we call it. And the array that it returns, the first element is always going to contain a reference, or is only going to contain the current value of the state variable. So it's going to have the value zero initially. The second is the mutator method or function, sorry that we can use within our code if we want to change the state variable. And if we look down at the what the component actually displays, so this, this is consistent with what I showed you on the screen a moment ago. And the important part is my button here. So on my button, I've got an onClick handler and the onClick handler is invoking a local function. Here's the function here. And what do I do inside in the click handler? I call the mutator. And I just compute the new value that I want the uh, that I want the count state variable to have. So it just as a simple addition, take the current value, add the prop, jump to it, and set that to be the new value of my state variable. But as again, what I said was whenever our code invokes that function, what actually happens is React Runtime will execute the entire component from beginning to end, okay? Um, and I can kind of prove that to myself because I've got a console.log here. So that console.log should be outputting to the Chrome Dev, Dev Tools every time I click the button. And that kind of proves to me that it does actually execute the entire component from beginning to end. It's not that it just kind of executes the return part. Uh, it goes through the whole lot. And again, if I go back to here and open up my dev tools, I'll just do a refresh just to clean. And every time I click my button, you see over here stuff appearing. So these are coming from the console.log that I have in my in my code. And so that kind of proves to me that the entire component function is executed from beginning to end. But of course, each time the component re-renders or re-executes, there's a new value now for count, the count variable. Uh, and that's kind of proven here as well. Uh, that's it really. Uh, that's, that's A, how you declare a state variable. And this is how you change the state variable and you can kind of react does the rest it takes care of the re-rendering for you 
There is something kind of unusual though, uh, but we don't need to dwell on it. Uh, what I mean by that is the first time this component executes, uh, the count variable is going to take its value from here. But whenever it re-renders, whenever the component re-renders or re-executes, it somehow ignores this value and it now returns what the correct new value of count should be. And the new value is really going to be dictated by whatever you would have done here. So you state is implemented in some sort of sophisticated way so that it somehow knows uh, that it knows when it has been invoked for the first time and it knows that when it's being invoked subsequent to the first time. The first time it's being invoked, it knows I need to use this as the initial value to return back as my count value. But on subsequent executions, it knows to ignore this uh, and return whatever the new count value should be. So that's state. Um, and that is critical to how React actually works. Just pause for a second in case you've got any questions. No, um, I had three stories in my, uh, so the story that I've executed is, uh, or demonstrated is the, is the normal one, uh, which is this one here. Uh, what if we execute this story where we don't pass any jump value to our uh, component? And if I go back and look at the code, there's some code here down at the bottom and I was ignoring it up to now, but this is how you, specify default values for props. The syntax is, is very clumsy. And to be honest, I don't use it a lot in the components that I develop with you throughout this uh, module, but this is how you do it anyway. Uh, you essentially add on what's called a static property to the component itself. Like counter is actually my component name. And you can add on what are called static properties to it now. The static property that we're interested in is the prop, uh, default prop property. And you give that static property, you initialize it to an object. The structure of the object depends on the structure of the properties that that component expects. And you know it can be as sophisticated as you want it to be. If you've got a prop that's a, an object with a certain structure to it, then you can detail exactly the default value that you want to give to that. Uh, structure, the default prop value you want to give to it if a prop isn't passed in. Uh, as I'm here, this is how we actually kind of express type checking on a prop. And what this is kind of telling us, and you, you kind of work it out is, it seems to be indicating that the jump prop has to be of type number. Uh, where prop type is coming from there, that's a special separate uh, library that the React framework uses. It's not unique to React. So it's a library that allows us to express type checking on objects. Again, it, the syntax is not very clean, but it is very complete, this prop types library. And after today, I, I don't actually use it. I probably should, but I don't. So, um, just to, to execute the, 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 just to prove that this, this does actually work, you know, so for the story where I don't give it a prop, which is, let's see, it's this one here. You can see here, like it's actually, it's telling me that the, 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 the prop, the jump prop is gonna get a value of two. And that comes from that syntax I showed you there a moment ago. And apart from that, it just works as before. The final story is related to the type checking. So in my code, I'm saying prop has to be of type number. But in this story, in the third story, I'm passing in, uh, I'm passing in a string. Now, all React will do for you is it will it will put a warning message uh, onto out to the developer tools console telling you that you you're passing an incorrect type of prop into the component. So it's more for the developer than the user. 
and just to show you what that error will look like. So if I try and let's see if I can leave all three of them open now. If I open all three. Right, and if I try and I'm just going to clean the right hand side. If I click on the exception one, this is the this is the story that tries to pass high. And you can see the, the message here, this uh, exception, if you read it, it's basically telling you that you're passing the incorrect type of prop. You're using a component incorrectly. So it's just a warning. So it's always a good idea to have your developer tools open when you're developing any kind of React apps. The behavior kind of is not what you'd expect, but if I keep clicking my button, the component is, is still going to work. In this case, it's going to work. In many cases, it would crash if you pass in the incorrect type of prop. But if I click the button for a while, that's what actually happens. So it's doing string concatenation rather than uh, numerical addition. Right, that's uh, this idea of component state. So it's this special function uh, called useState. Uh, the function is referred to as a hook. And there are loads of other hooks uh, that we look at, but that's just what the React team decided to call. Not just this function, but a whole uh, series of functions. And what it does is it, it allows you to declare a state variable and it returns a tuple as I've outlined. That's okay, that bit at the end. So that's the 101 on component state. Just in passing the sample little counter component there was the first time that we've seen event handling happening in a React app. Uh, we know that the browser is an event-driven environment. And so the whole notion of events and event handlers, which I mentioned on week one, I think, or maybe week two, uh, that's obviously a central part of React code as well. The nice thing, though, is that uh, the, the events that are fired by the browser uh, as a result of whatever the user interacting with the what's displayed on the screen, those events are native to the browser, but the React runtime will wrap them in a browser neutral or uh, browser agnostic event. It's Technically, the name of the event is synthetic uh, event. You don't even really need to know that. So that is that is the event that your React code is going to be catching, if you like, and handling, rather than the browser's native event, which is what makes React uh, browser neutral. Uh, there's a slight difference between the native event names, which I'm just listing some of them here, and the names that the React engine, uh, the React runtime uses. So there's just a, a slight difference. So the, the native ones are always lowercase, whereas the React events are kind of camel case, as you can see there. So if you've done any native event handling before, you just have to get used to the fact that it should be camel case you should be using for your event names rather than the lowercase. If you want to get the full list of events, you can get out here. Don't really think you need to look at that though. And so this is kind of documenting uh, again what I've kind of said. This is the kind of flow now that you that we kind of come across uh, time and time again when we talk to re talk about React. Uh, the flow being the user does something. In this case, clicks a button. That is an event, and we have an event handler associated with it. In this case, in our case, it was a non-click event handler. In the, uh, in the event handler, we changed the components state variable. Okay, you can do anything you want to inside the event handler. But in our case, we changed the state variable. In nine times out of 10, you will be making a change to a state variable. And then from then on, React kind of takes over. React runtime then does the rest. It takes care of... Uh, re-rendering your component. And of course, on re-rendering the component, the component more than likely changes what it wants to, it changes the DOM effectively behind the scenes. And of course, if the DOM changes, then the browser knows I need to repaint the screen. So that is really what's happening in the kind of re-rendering. The DOM is actually being changed. 
So that's component state. Next, I want to talk about data flow. Now, there's a couple of messages that I want to get across from this diagram here. So the diagram is showing you your typical um, component breakdown for a React app. I, I did mention last week that every single React app is going to be a hierarchy of components. You can never get away from that. Uh, and so that's reflected here. The second thing that I want to get across here is that uh, this is the kind of color coding that I'm using. So any box that has this kind of colored background, I don't know, is it a kind of an orangey brown? That's my way of representing a stateful component. In other words, it has a state variable or variables, maybe could be more than one. Whereas the ordinary white boxes are stateless. They do not have any state variables. And your typical component hierarchy is going to have a mixture of stateful and stateless. The stateful ones will be in the minority by a long way. The stateless ones will be in the majority. That's always going to be the case. We'll, we'll discuss later on as to how you come up with a decision as to whether a component should be stateful or stateless. The third thing is, um, now, sorry, this relationship here between this component and these two, or the relationship between this component and these two, uh, what, what the connection is representing is the fact that if we looked at the return statement of this component, it would contain references to these two. Similarly, if we looked at the return statement of this component, it would include references to these two in its JSX. Okay, that's what I'm that's what I'm representing by this connecting arrow here. It's got nothing to do with inheritance or anything like that. That's point number three, I guess. Is it? point number four is that props, which are passed down, which are passed from component to component, props can only flow in a downward direction. Hence, as the title of the slide says, data flow is unidirectional in a React app. You cannot uh, get props to flow in any direction other than downward. And that was a conscious decision made by the React design team because other frameworks at the time supported what is known as two-way data binding, which allowed data to flow in both directions. Uh, the, the consequence of the this unidirection data flow is that it becomes easier for the developer to rationalize what's happening in their app. Um, it, it, the, the learning curve is slightly steeper initially, um, but once you're comfortable with the notion, it actually becomes easier to essentially debug your apps. With two-way data binding, it was kind of the reverse. With two-way data binding, uh, it was easier to get your app up and running, but it was harder to debug. So they, th that was the rationale that they uh, used to decide on this two, uh, unidirectional data flow. Now, uh, another point is that whenever we know now that when this is a state full components, let's say, and I've already been just telling you that if this component's state variable changes, then this component is going to re-render, it's going to re-execute. But if that component has children, which it does, then its children are also going to re-render. And if they have children, which they do, then they are also going to re-render. That means that this stateful component here, if one of its state variable changes, probably as a result of the user interacting with some part of the screen, then this is going to re-render and every other component in the hierarchy is going to re-render as well. That may seem inefficient, uh, but a little bit later on, I'll explain to you why it's not as inefficient as you think, but you need to accept that that is actually what happens. Uh, the other thing, another point that I want to make from this diagram is, uh, so let's suppose in this component re-renders and in the re-rendering or the re-execution of the component, it computes the fact that it doesn't actually want this component to, re to be part of the hierarchy at all. So it, it kind of maybe had some sort of conditional statement wrapped around a reference to this component up here. And if the conditional statement is false, then it essentially ignores this part of the hierarchy. So in the re-rendering of this component, 
this is going to re-render, but this connection here is actually going to be detached. And if it's detached, it means that this component and all of its children are no longer going to be contributing anything to what's displayed on the screen. So what we say is that this component has been detached from the DOM or unmounted. We talk about mounting and unmounting in React uh, language. So components can mount or become attached to the DOM and unmount become detached from the DOM. That can happen multiple times while an app is running in the browser. And whenever a component is detached or unmounted, then it simply means that whatever that component contributes to what's being displayed on the screen, that no longer appears on the screen. Uh, if that component later on reattaches itself to the DOM, then what it contributes to the screen is going to appear again. And that's part of the whole dynamics aspect of React. Uh, similarly, this component down here is stateful, you know, uh, whenever one of its state variable changes, it re-renders and its, its child re-renders. Some of the re-renderings of this may, one may cause this component to be detached from the DOM, you know, so it's the same, the principles are the same. So there's a lot of messages that you need to get from this diagram that I'm showing you, and I'm kind of documenting them on the next slide. I don't think I'm going to go through them in detail because I've actually already uh, told you the, the full story, I hope. Uh, I'm just going to quickly scan down to them. That's okay. That's okay. And I've, I've already alluded to this. This is what I've just been describing. So that's unidirectional data flow. And then there are all the other uh, uh, points that I made in relation to mounting and unmounting of components and the mixture of stateful and stateless components uh, three that props can only flow in a downward direction that's data flow uh, albeit in a very kind of abstract way next topic is hooks and component lifecycle so we've actually seen hooks already and the use state function I said was what React team called a hook function. These hooks were introduced in February of 2019. So React has been around since 2012. Uh, so how come they waited until 2019 to introduce this hook functionality? Well, what hooks can do for you, you could always do. Uh, but you had to implement your components slightly differently. And the way we used to implement them pre-2019, we implemented our React components as classes. Uh, and we had to implement those classes had to inherit from some super classes defined by the framework. And then we had to implement certain methods in our component implementations. We inherited certain methods from those super classes. So that's the way it worked pre February 2019. But uh, from then onwards, we now always implement our components as functions. And we use these special hook functions to achieve what we used to do in the old kind of program model. But essentially, uh, so what is a hook? Uh, I'm saying quite simply, it's nothing other than just a function. And we've seen that with the use state example. Uh, some of these hooks will actually be higher order functions. In other words, they will take a callback as an argument. We'll see that in a few moments. What these hook functions are all about is manipulating uh, a component's state and also managing its life cycle. And the third point isn't really that important. I've just mentioned that the, the use of these hooks now really meant that we no longer have to implement our components as classes. So if you read any articles, if you come across an article on React and you see the components implemented as classes, then essentially you're reading the old programming model and probably shouldn't read the article uh, at all because it's too out of date. 
so you state is one example of a hook function, and there are many others. Uh, what you'll notice about all of the hooks is that they all begin with the prefix use. And what that is, uh, why that decision was made is to help uh, the JavaScript linting tools to check the correctness of your code. A linter, if you may or may not know, a linter is a JavaScript tool that can analyze your static JavaScript code for certain uh, bad programming practices. Now, it turns out that these hook functions, we should only invoke them in certain circumstances or certain contexts. And so by prefixing the hook name with use, there are link, the linter tools can check to make sure that we are using the hooks in the right context. Now, what do I mean by that? And what, I'm, uh, what I mean by that is the following. So there are these rules that you have to abide by. The main one really, and there probably is only one rule, which is that you can only invoke a hook function from what I'm calling the top level of a component. Put it another way, you cannot invoke a hook function, let's say within the body of a for loop or within a conditional statement inside an if statement. Uh, you're just not allowed to do that because the hook won't work properly as a result. And so if you happen to invoke, let's say the use state hook within an if statement inside a component, then you will get a warning message, an error message really, when you try and transpile that code. And that error message is being generated by a linting tool that's actually running behind the scenes. Um, I suppose it's obvious that there isn't much point in calling any of these hooks from an ordinary JavaScript function because they only have meaning in the context of React components. Although you'll see me doing something a little bit later, later on, which might seem that it's violating rule number two, but it's not really. So the main rule is this one here. That's what I mean by this is the what I was talking about there that you have to you have to use these hooks within certain kind of um, context or within certain restrictions and so the restriction is as I'm stating there. And that was the case in our counter. We called it the use state hook uh, within the main body, if you like, of our component code. So the second hook that I want to look at, uh, use state is by far and away the most important one. The second most important one is a hook called use effect. You might remember when I was talking about JavaScript, I talked about this notion of side effects. If you've got a JavaScript function that uh, performs some sort of side effect, then essentially it's, it's either accessing something outside of its scope or it's trying to change something outside of its scope. And so, if you, in a component, if you want the component to perform some side effect, then you've got to put that side effect code uh, inside the use effect hook, as we'll see. So it's using, you want to perform side effects within a React component. And really the, the most common side effect is if your component wants to talk to a web API, uh, clearly accessing, communicating with the web API is outside of the component's own kind of scope. So we have to put that code buried within a use effect invocation by means of a callback, as it turns out. Another common example is if you want to register your component with certain browser-based events, um, like maybe the resizing of the browser window, whenever that event occurs, Clearly, the resizing of a browser window is some event that happens outside the scope of a component. But for whatever reason, maybe your component wants to change what it displays. If the window, uh, the browser window is resized, maybe it wants to remove some detail from the component in terms of what it renders on the screen. So there, the first one is by far and away the most common side effect. Uh, the second one is probably the second most common one. So the, this use effect hook, uh, this is a signature. You've got to pass it a callback, which we know is a function. So we would say the use effect is a higher order function because it takes a function as an argument. And the second argument that expects is what's called a dependency array. 
and we'll see what the purpose of the dependency array is in a moment, but it is an array and it typically has references to other, uh, it has references to other variables within the component, be they state variables or maybe ordinary local variables, could possibly be props as well. Um, and we'll see what, is, what the purpose of it is in a moment. And so I'm saying here that the callback is where uh, you put your side effect code, whatever the nature of the code is. When is this use effect executed? Um, it's executed automatically when the, re the related component is mounted on the DOM. We talked about mounting and unmounting components there a moment ago. So always when a component is mounted onto the DOM for the first time or remounted after it has been unmounted, then the use effect uh, hook will execute. And secondly, the use effect hook will execute every time the related component re-renders, provided one of the entries in its dependency array has changed since the last re-rendering. So if you've got a component that's a stateful component, does it have to be stateful? It doesn't actually have to be stateful. Uh, you, you've got a component. It's got the use effect hook invocation within it. Uh, it's mounted onto the DOM, and then periodically that component re-renders. It's never unmounted, but it's re-rendering multiple times. Every time it re-renders, React needs to check, do I need to execute the use effect hook? And the way it does it is, it checks each of the entries in the dependency array to see, have they changed their value since the previous re-rendering? And if any one of them has, then it will execute the callback. Otherwise, it ignores the callback. Okay, so there's two scenarios. Um, and finally, I'm saying quite often, really, what you want the use effect is you want the use effect to run when the component is mounted and not to run again for any subsequent re rendering of that component. And if that's the case, then you simply pass an empty array um, up here. Just pass an empty array to the use effect hook and you get that behavior where it only executes on the mounting of the component. It will also execute on the remounting, but once a component is mounted, no matter how many times it re-renders, uh, the callback will, will not be executed um, if the dependency array is empty. So I've got an example illustrating this and we're moving into the app world now. We're moving away from just isolated components. So I'll just show you the simple example running first. And this example is part of the archive for this week. So if you grab this archive here, download it and unzip it, then what you will get is, just gonna close off this stuff first. So when you unzip the archive, you get a folder like this, and inside it, it'll have two subfolders. And I want to look at this one first. So this is the app that I want to look at now. And you have to run npm install on this, uh, as you might expect, because I've got a package.json you can see there. And run npm install. And if I now just start up the app, So it's a React app, or sorry, it's a, it's a React app created using the Create React App tool that you uh, would have used in last week's second lab. And what the app does is it communicates with the random user web API just to grab a list of randomly generated user profiles, which I am kind of referring to as, these are my list of friends, Maria. Okay, and I can filter through this list. So if I type something into the text box, it's going to filter the list for me. So if I type uh, W, okay, that's what the app does. Now on the slides, I'm showing you the 
architecture of the app from a component breakdown point of view. And don't worry about how did I come up with this architecture? Don't worry about how did I decide which components are stateful and stateless? We'll deal with that later on. Just for now, just you need to understand what this uh, component uh, breakdown is, is saying to us. And so I've got a component at the top of my hierarchy, which I've called the friends app component. It is a stateful component. And down here I'm documenting uh, the nature of the state variables within it. In fact, there are, uh, there are two state variables in this component here. One is going to contain the list of friends that I've recovered from the retrieve from the web API. And the second state variable will contain the current value of my text box. Okay. This component here, what it's responsible for is it's responsible for generating the list of friends or really the list of matching friends maybe. Uh, once some, the user types something into the text box, what this component will do is compute the list of matching friends. It will pass that list or array down to this component. And what it does then is it essentially maps over that array of friends and for each entry in the array of friends, it will render one of these friend components. So a friend component is going to be responsible for just generating one friend entry in my list, whereas this component kind of manages the entire list, if you like. So these two components are, are not that interesting. Uh, this is the more interesting one. And of course, we have this idea of, you know, if this re-renders, if a state variable changes, it re-renders and its children re-render. And we know uh, kind of what I've said is, and we look at the code in a moment, is that this component is going to be talking to the web API to get the list of friends. So it's going to use the use effect hook to achieve that. So I guess we can look at the code now really at this stage. And I kind of take it from the, the bottom up. I look at the least interesting components first. This is the friend component. Okay, It's passed in a friend object. And really, it doesn't do anything interesting other than just display one friend entry. Okay, It doesn't have any state variables. It's just passed in a prop. And the prop is an object, um, which is the structure of the object that's returned by the web API for one, one user profile, if you like. The filtered friends list, this component, which is the one in the middle of my hierarchy, it's passed in a, an array of friend objects as a prop. And here we are, we're mapping over the list of friends. We saw that last week. And as I said, that's a pattern that we use a lot. So prop.list will be an array of friend objects. I'm just mapping over them. And for each one, I am generating an instance of the friend component. So that's all that's going on there. And then at the top of my hierarchy is this one here. And this is the one that we will spend some time on. If I just look at the index.js, nothing too uh, involved going on there. I'm just importing the app.js and that's the one that I'm mounting on to the DOM. Okay, so friends app is the component at the top of the hierarchy and that's implemented here. And so from the top down, I've got two state variables. Uh, this is the one, this is the one, sorry, this is the one that's managing, sorry, it's the one that contains the current content of the search text box. So I'm initializing it to an empty string, which makes sense. Uh, this is the one that's gonna contain the list of friends returned by the web API, the full list and I'm initializing it to an empty array. And I guess uh, in terms of the use effect hook, that's really why we're discussing this example at all. Here's my use effect hook. And the first argument to it is this callback. And my callback begins here and ends there. And apart from the console.log, I'm using the fetch function that's um, native to every browser to talk to my web API. My web API is the random user API that we saw 
that you would have used uh, in last week's lab. So I'm just grabbing, it turns out I'm grabbing 10 user profiles and I'm just using those user profiles as my friends Maria. Eventually when the web API responds, what do I do? I change one of my state variables. I change the second of my state variables up here. So that's gonna cause a re-rendering. Also, uh, what's going on here is all I'm doing here is I'm computing the matching list of friends. In other words, I'm looking at the full list of friends and I am, sorry, sorry, no, wrong, sorry, incorrect. Sorry, this is what I want to talk about next, sorry. This is where I'm uh, computing my matching list of friends. So I'm still see, filtering over my full list of friends and I'm using the contents of the text box, which is uh, the text box is here. Okay, I'm using that to determine whether the friend should be included in this output array or not. So, so that's stuff we should be familiar with from last week. It's an notion of filtering. And then down in the return statement, I am passing down the I'm passing down the matching list of friends down to my filtered friends list component. So this is the list that has been computed up here. I also have a text box and here's my text box and it has an on change listener. In other words, whenever the user types something into the text box, I want this event handler to execute. And if I scroll up, here's the event handler. And uh, just to explain what's going on here now, automatically, uh, so this is a function, maybe I should make it explicit. This is a, an event handler, but it is a function. Automatically React will pass the event that has occurred into the function. That happens automatically. You know, I didn't do anything down here to achieve that. It happens automatically. Um, and what am I doing? All I'm doing, let's see, um, what I'm doing here is I'm essentially trying to access the contents of the text box. So event, event dot target, that expression will refer to the text box itself. And that value then will access the value within that text box. So that's a bit of old kind of um, DOM manipulation code ish in a way, um, but pretty easy to understand. And I'm just lower casing it just to make sure that my app is not case sensitive. Uh, this is kind of boilerplate code. What that is essentially doing is stopping the event from being handled by any other component in my hierarchy. It's something that we kind of do by default. It's what's referred to as preventing the event from bubbling up through the component hierarchy. So it has no function other than that. I'd say even if I took that line out, certainly in, this, in the case of this app, if I remove that line, it would have no effect on my, on my app. But for larger apps, uh, it's something you may need to be aware of. So, um, but so th th this is this is like my button handler earlier on. So we know now that whenever the user types something into the text box, I perform a state change. Okay, I perform a state change so my component re-renders, and every time it re-renders, it recomputes this, and so it's passing a new array down to my subordinate component every time. But in terms of the use effect hook, this use effect hook is going to execute when the component is mounted. In other words, really when I start up my app initially, the use effect hook executes. And that makes sense because I, I do want to make a web API call, but I really don't want the web API call to happen ever again. And that's why I'm passing an empty array as my dependency array to the use effect. Now, um, I've also just kind of scattered some console.logs to 
clarify some points to you. So there's a console.log here at the beginning of the use effect callback. And there's a console.log here. And there's also a console.log inside in uh, the filter friends list. And there's a console.log inside in the friend component. And the reason I did that is to try to illustrate the flow of control, I suppose, if you like, in our app as the user is interacting with it and as all of these state variables are changing and the user effect hook uh, is running. So if I go back to my slides. So yeah, I'm using the random user API. That's okay. We're familiar with that from last week. So the first point that you need to be aware of, and it's generic, right, is that the use effect runs at the end of a component's mount time. So the only component I'm interested now is the one at the top of the hierarchy. And even though my use effect hook is close to the top of that component's code flow, the use effect hook itself is not actually executed until the component has rendered for the first time. And I'll prove that to you in a moment. The second point, which is specific to this app, I'm saying is that because the callback is actually making an asynchronous uh, call to the web API, then we need to be conscious of that. That well, sorry, that means that well, as a consequence of that, my app is going to render before the web API response comes back. So you need to make sure that you accommodate that in your code. Now, what that really translates to for this particular app is I've got to make sure that I initialize the state variable that's going to hold my full list of friends. I need to initialize it to an empty array. If I initialize it to null or undefined, then my, my app is actually going to crash uh, because of this fact here. Uh, and I'll show that to you in a second. What I'm showing you here is the sequence of the console.logs that execute uh, uh, from my app. So if I kind of zoom in a little bit on it. So the render friends app, that is coming from the console.log that's in my top component. This console.log is coming from the use effect hook. And notice it's actually happening after this. Now, again, if I go back and look at my code, you might think that the first time this component renders, the first console.log that will happen, because really all this is here is just a method call. We're, in, we're invoking a, sorry, I keep calling a method a function. We're invoking this function at this stage in the flow of control of this outer component function. So you'd expect this console.log to happen first, but in fact, it doesn't. The first console.log that appears in the developer tools is this one. And so the reason for that is because the use effect will not execute until after my component has rendered for the first time. So, uh, component renders for the first time, then the use effect hook executes. Now, because this particular use effect makes an API call, eventually the API response comes back. And we saw that in the use effect hook, we change the one of the state variables in my component. Uh, we change the state variable that stores the full list of friends. So on changing that state variable, that's what causes my component to re-render a second time. Then let's suppose the user types something into the text box. Typing something into the text box is an event. The event handler associated with that changes the second state variable in my friend's app component, which is causes the component to re-render a third time. So you need to be clear on why I get this sequence of console.logs for that particular component at the top of the hierarchy.
Yeah, this is the point I was making a few moments ago, probably a little bit too early. Uh, we must accommodate, I'm saying, the asynchronous nature of the API call that's happening in our in our um, in our app. Like what we don't want is we don't want our browser to freeze until the response comes back from the web API. We, we want the app to render something at least back to the user so that, that they don't just get a spinner on the screen on a blank screen. And also uh, we want to, sorry, one other thing we want to allow. Oh yeah, we, we want to allow our component to render even though it doesn't have any data available to it yet from the web API. So the, 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 the solution to it, ensuring both of these really was to initialize the state variable that's storing the full list of friends, initialize it to an empty array. That was the trick. If I had done it, if I'd initialized it to null, which may seem like an insignificant difference, that means that because it's null, the first time my component, the friends app component renders, it's going to try and filter over a null variable, which it cannot do. It can filter over an empty array. Okay, it's going to produce uh, an output, an, an empty array as its output as well. But when we, when we try to perform a filter on the null object, if you like, then we're going to get our, our commonly reoccurring error um, uh, trying to access an undefined, you know, trying to access a property or an undefined. And again, if I can just prove to you what I'm, what I'm trying to get across here is that the problem is going to happen when we try and execute this here. If this, if this is an empty array, it's fine. If it's null or anything else, it's going to cause my application to crash. And just to prove it to you, if I change this to null, and I'm saving it now, essentially my app is going to uh, do a complete refresh. And there we go. That's the error coming from the um, coming from the uh, app itself. Okay. Check my watch. Right. What's next? Um, okay, uh, what I'm showing you here now is, sorry, if I go back to the previous screen, sorry, this one here, these console.logs were just coming from the friends app component. That's the one at the top of my hierarchy. But of course, every time the friends app component re-renders, its children we render and its grandchildren we render. And that's what I'm showing you here. Uh, so I've enabled the console.logs in all of my components now. And so, you know, there's a lot of re rendering going on. Um, and again, if I kind of zoom in on it, so the Friends app component, sorry, no. Uh, component at the top of the hierarchy, which is Friends app, that renders for the first time. We don't have any data, of course. We have an empty array, an empty list of friends. But that empty list of friends is, uh, that empty list of friends is filtered over to produce an output, which is also an empty list of friends. And that empty array of friends is passed down to the filter friends list component. That's the one in the middle of my hierarchy. And it maps over that empty array, but it does render, this component does render, or it does execute, as I suppose really, it does execute, uh, but it doesn't produce any real output. It doesn't uh, produce in, in the array of friend components, that's also empty. So we don't get any rendering of a friend component at this stage. Then in my use effect hook executes, it makes the API call, Eventually, the API will respond, and that causes my friends app component to re-render. I now have, is it 10 friends? My text box is empty. Uh, when I 
when I perform the filtering of that array of 10 friends, I get an output array, which also contains 10 friends, and I pass those 10 friends down to my filtered friends list. In fact, I think I actually changed it to six friends in this case, so that I could actually display this on one screen. So it's a, it's an array of six. My full list of friends is, contains six. I pass the full six friends down to this component, and then we get each a rendering of the friend component for each friend in my list. So I get all of these render. The next thing is the user types something into the text box. That causes a state change in the component at the top of the hierarchy. Therefore, it re-renders. Now, my use effect hook is not going to execute ever again because I passed it a, an empty dependency array. But the friends app component does re-render because one of its state variables has changed. Uh, the friends app component is going to compute the updated list of matching friends, which presumably is going to be a smaller array than what was computed up here. That updated list of matching friends is passed down to this component, and it maps over them and renders an instance of the friend component for each uh, friend in that new list. And moving on. The user types another character into the text box, same story. Note that there are fewer friends being rendered each time. That makes sense. So the difference between, so there's two friends rendered, um, there's two friends rendered here, whereas up here there was one, two, three, four. So we would say that two of the, the components uh, from, Sorry, I would say that four friend components were mounted onto the DOM here. Whereas when we got down to here, two of these four were unmounted from the DOM or detached from the DOM, and hence they don't appear on the screen at all. And the same happened between here and here. Up here, we have six instances of the friend component mounted onto the DOM. Two of them were removed when this flow executed here. So this idea of mounting and unmounting is actually happening um, between each block that I'm kind of uh, explaining, um, describing here. The friends app component, once it mounts, it's never unmounts or it never detaches. And equally the filtered friends list component, once it mounts, it never is unmounted from the DOM. That just happens to be the case for this particular app. There's always one or two components that are never detached from the DOM. And they're usually at the very top of the hierarchy. So, you know, you can play with this yourselves, you know, enable all the console.logs throughout the code, and then play with the application and see what's happening over in the developer tools, uh, just to clarify for yourselves exactly the flow of control that's happening here. Now I've got a second version of the same application and the way you get the second version of the application to, to run is if you go into the index.js and what I want to do is I want to change it to refer to the app2.js instead of the app.js. So I'll just simply go up here and change this to app2. and save. And now I've got an error. Did I undo that error? I thought I did. Missing semicolon. Seven.
don't know why it's giving me that. Sorry. Okay, let's see, let's do something drastic. If it'll let me. Right, so what has changed is I've added in this reset button. Uh, other than that, the app behaves as before, but what the reset button does is it causes my app to make a new request to the random user web API for 10 new friends. So you'll see every time I click this, that it's the full list of friends is changing. And I simply overwrite the list of friends in my friends app component. I don't add the new list, the new 10 friends that were returned by the web API. I don't add them to the current list of friends. I just do a simple overwrite just for convenience really. Uh, but obviously, you know, clicking this is going to cause the particular use effect that makes the web API call. I want that to execute every time I click this button. Not only does it execute when the app is loaded into the browser, it also has to execute uh, on the basis of the button clicking. And other than that, the, the rest is as before. But we have complicated things uh, a little bit. So from an app UI point of view, um, what I'm saying is that there is a reset button as we saw. Oh yeah, and the second thing is I want to change Sorry, here. Um, I want to write into the browser's tab the, the number of friends that are currently being displayed. And you might have just noticed that if I go back to the browser again, if you watch it over here in the top right, you can see that it's actually showing how many friends are being displayed. And if I type something into the text box, and you know it's changing that value over there. So writing something to the browser's tab is another example of a side effect that I want my app to perform. And so I'm going to need a, sep a second use effect hook to do that for me. So from a UI perspective, we have our reset button and we have our uh, updating our browsers tab and the design of the app is the exact same as before but the additional code now is really going to be happening inside here i've got an extra state variable i have three state variables now the two that i had before but i'm also going to be recording the the clicking of the reset button uh, using a boolean and this boolean is just going to change from true to false back to true back to false it's just being toggled but every time it toggles from true to false or from false to true we want our app to make a new request to the web api from a side effects point of view as i said there are two side effects now making the web api call and the second side effect is writing something to the browser's tab Writing to the browser's tab is not an asynchronous thing, uh, but it, it, it is a side effect. And so we put that code into the use effect hook. 
And I think I could, if I look at the code now for that and just look at the parts that are different, as I said, it's a component at the top of the hierarchy that I'm interested in only. And so scanning down through it, here's our additional state variable, which I just arbitrarily initialized to true. I could have set it to false initially, but it's a Boolean anyway. Uh, here's one use effect, the one that we've seen already. But the difference is the dependency array now has an entry in it because, as I said, I want the um, I want to make a request to the web API every time the button is clicked. And every time the button is clicked, I am going to be changing this state variable. And so here I'm just referring to the state variable. And anytime it changes, this side effect is going to execute. What would cause the state variable to change? Well, if I scan down to the JSX and just find the button itself, here it is here. Got an on-click handler associated with it. The on-click handler. Sometimes if the on-click handler is just a one-liner, you can actually put the on-click handler buried within the JSX. And that's really what I'm doing here. Um, I'm just calling the setter method or the mutator for the particular state variable. And I'm just toggling whatever the current value is, just negate, invert it. So if it's true, make it false and vice versa. So that's my event handler. Uh, this is gonna cause my component to re-render, but this for this particular version of the app, when it does re-render, now this side effect or use effect hook is going to execute if that state variable changes. It's also going to execute this, this side effect or use effect is also going to execute when the component is mounted initially. Uh, but the, uh, the dependency array causes it to execute on a number of other occasions. The second side effect is here. And this is really old DOM manipulation code. This is how you change the browser's tab content. This is not React code now, as I said, this is DOM API manipulation code. Uh, and its dependency array is not a state variable, actually. Its dependency array is determined by the length of this array. This array is the list of friends that has been outputted from my filter operation. And whenever that list changes in size, whenever the length of that array changes, then that's the only time I want to update the browser's tab. So the dependency array, you know, it can be, refer to any type of typically numeric value. It doesn't have to be though, as it turns out, but uh, in any of our cases, it probably will be a numeric value. Uh, well, sorry, it isn't. So, I mean, we have a Boolean up here, but sorry, a, a, a variable, I suppose, a variable that has either a numeric value or a string value or a Boolean value, a primitive, let's say, but it doesn't have to be. Uh, and also just in passing, the, it, 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 it's a dependency array, it's not a dependency variable. So in very complex applications, you may have a number of variables being uh, referred to from the dependency array. And if any one of them changes, that will cause the GUI side effect to execute. So other than that, um, the app is as before, but it's obviously complicated by the addition of the second side effect, the addition of the second state variable, third state variable, and the fact that our dependency array now has something actually in them, which means our side effect is gonna not just execute at mount time, but it will execute on subsequent re-renderings, depending on whether this, the dependency array value changes or not. So it would be worth your while making sure that you understand the flow, again, using console.logs, which I have again kind of scattered. You can see I have a console.log here, and I've got a console.log inside in the second side effect, as well as the console.log 
that will tell me that the entire component has re-rendered. Um, and back to my slides. So all of this, again, is just showing you in this screenshot, I'm showing you the various console.logs that happen as the user interacts with the app. And I don't think it's really worth my while talking through them. You really have to kind of play with it yourself. But at mount time, when the app mounts and when the friend's app component, the one at the top of the hierarchy, when that mounts for the first time, well, obviously the component renders. Then my two use effect hooks execute. Uh, so this one is actually going to write zero matches to the browser tab because I don't have any friends retrieved from the web API yet. Eventually, I get 10 friends back or whatever number of friends back from the web API, which means uh, there's a state variable change. So my component re-renders again. Uh, on this re-rendering, the side effect that changes the browser tab is going to execute again because now, uh, whereas up here, I only had zero friends. Now I've got 10 friends. So the list of my, my filtered list, if you like, uh, has changed. The length of it has changed to from zero to 10. So that executes to write 10 to the browser tab. Eventually, uh, then the user starts typing something into the text box. And again, by typing something into the text box, my list of matching friends is computed and therefore the, the use effect that changes the browser tab has to execute as well as the component itself re-rendering. Uh, after clicking the reset button, that causes a state change. So the component re-renders. The side effect, the use effect um, that makes the API call, its dependency array referred to the state variable that has changed as a result of the user clicking the reset button. Therefore, that use effect is going to execute and make another API call. Eventually, the data comes back. Um, when the data comes back from the API, it changes the relevant state variable, the one that stores the full list of friends. The changing of the state variable causes the component to re-render. On this re-rendering, it computes the matching list and that list is going to be bigger than it was before. Therefore, I need to update the browser's tab and on and on it goes. Here, I'm just documenting exactly as best I can anyway, what happens A, when the app, when the friend's app mounts for the first time. Secondly, what happens when the user types something into the text box. And thirdly, what happens when the user clicks the reset button in terms of when the use effect hooks actually execute. So you need to play with that, uh, I think, yourselves. So a lot there, uh, but that was all about uh, the second hook, the use effect hook, and the component life cycle. So you saw how the component's life cycle was kind of influenced by state variable changing and use effects uh, executing as well. I want to go back to data flow. I'm sure you may have questions now, but I'm happy to take any questions if you want to ask me anything. Or maybe you want to leave them until the labs. That's fine. As it turns out now, this week's lab, you won't be actually using either of the hooks. So I would strongly suggest that you spend time playing with the archive that you download and the the, the 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 filter friends app there that I've just been talking my way through. I would uh, encourage you just to play with that. Use various consoles.logs that are in there and put in other consoles.logs if you want to and make sure you're happy with your understanding of how the flow of control uh, happens within uh, that particular app. Now, back to data flow. I said that 
data flows in one direction, and that is true. There is a second kind of data flow pattern, um, although it doesn't really refer to it kind of, it seems to contradict the unidirectional idea, but it doesn't really. The second data flow pattern is, it has two names. It's called data down, action up. Uh, it's also called the inverse data flow pattern. I don't like the second name, the data down, action up is a more um, true to what we're, it actually is representing. Now, when do we need to use this second data flow pattern or when, when do we need to apply it to an app? And it turns out we apply it a lot, okay? And the scenario is, I'm saying here, what if a component, so I've got a state for component, but the changing of that state variable in that component is actually triggered by something that happens in a subordinate component be it an immediate subordinate or something further down the hierarchy. So I've got a, a state for component in my hierarchy. It has a state variable and the changing of that state variable happens as a result of an event that happens in another component that is further down the hierarchy. It can actually never be in a component that's higher up in the hierarchy, just uh, the way we design React apps that will never happen. So there's a separation between where the event occurs and the component that has the state variable that needs to change as a result of that event. When you've got that situation, which you will a lot, then you need to implement this data down action up pattern. I'm going to stick with the same app to demonstrate this, and we're going to do a slightly uh, different design in terms of component hierarchy for the app. Now my component hierarchy looks like this. So I still have all the ones that we had before and they still do all the same as before, but now I've got a new component over here called search box. And the search box is actually gonna now be responsible for managing the text box. Previously, I had that code up here, uh, but I'm putting it down here now. And it's probably a better design really to have it uh, in a separate component. But the state variable, that is storing the current contents of the text box, that's still going to be up here. So the state variable is here, but the event that's going to cause that state variable change is going to be managed down here because it's the component that's actually uh, managing the text box. So this component needs to somehow tell this component, you need to change your state variable and it'll tell it what to change the state variable to. And when the state variable changes, then we know what happens after that. Re-renderings happen. So um, the way it's going to work is this component, it will have a function. And in that function will be the code to change the state variable. But that function has to be passed down as a prop to this one. And whenever the event occurs, the event handler, which is down here, uh, in the event handler, it will call the function that was passed down to it from above. It will invoke the function. So it turns out now that props not only are a means of transport for data, but they can also be a means of transport for function references. It's not so much that we're passing the function down, we're just passing a reference to a, func to a function down uh, using the props medium. Now the code for this design is my second folder in my archive, which is uh, this one here. So if I import that into VS Code, And all we need to look at is in app.js. I've gotten rid of the reset button now. I've removed all that unnecessary complication uh, to demonstrate the second pattern. So we're back to the simple case of just having one use effect, no dependency array, et cetera, et cetera. And the new uh, feature is 
Okay, so I've got a function. Uh, where is it here? It's... Sorry, now let me check again. Oh yeah, right. Um, here's just a, an ordinary function and it has, uh, it changes a, the state variable uh, within it. But this function, we actually pass it down to my search box component, as you can see here. So it's just an ordinary prop uh, and I can call the prop anything I want to call it. So I decided to call it that. But what I'm passing down is a function, I'm not passing down data. And if I look at the search box component, then so in the search box in its JSX, it just has the text box, it has the on change event handler. Uh, in it and the event handler is this function up here. And what do we do inside in the function? We actually call the prop function that was passed down to it uh, to affect the state change in the, uh, the friends app component. This is the same as before. Here we're just, you know, grabbing the contents of the text box, and then we're just passing the contents of the text box up to the function that was passed down to me. And then the this this function, which is above in the uh, friends app component, as in. Here. It's passed up the current contents of the text box, and I'm just using that to change my state variable. And then the component re-renders and computes its matching list of friends, all of that as before. So that's the uh, data down action up pattern. And I think I'm just showing you excerpts from the code in this slide here. So again, the, the use case is you've got a stateful component, but the changing of that state variable is, is triggered by an event that happens in a subordinate component. In our case, the subordinate was immediately below the stateful component, but it could be further down the hierarchy. And what we do in terms of implementing uh, a solution to that problem is have your function in the stateful component that changes the state variable, but pass a reference to that function down via a prop to the component that actually handles the event or that catches the event associated with triggering the state change. So again, you can go back and look at that yourselves. These are just excerpts from the code. Uh, that I've just shown you. The last thing I want to talk about is the virtual DOM. Uh, I'm actually getting further than I thought I would get. Um, well, not so much, but uh, I thought I, I, it would be tighter on time. I hope I haven't gone through it too quickly. You may need to revisit the video later on, but it's up to you. So the virtual DOM. Now we know what the DOM is. Uh, it's this data structure that's constructed by the browser. And it is a mirror essentially of what is being displayed on the screen. Now in the static world, static web world, when the browser receives a HTML page, it takes, it analyzes that HTML and it creates a, a, a JavaScript object 
representation of it, a JavaScript object network, sorry, a representation of it, which we call the DOM. And then it analyzes the DOM and paints the screen. And whenever the DOM changes, uh, the browser will automatically update the screen. So what's this virtual DOM all about? Um, well, pre kind of React in the old days of developing web apps before we had any frameworks, then we wrote our JavaScript code to actually manipulate the DOM. And there were good practices and bad practices associated with that. So there are efficient ways and inefficient ways of manipulating the DOM. And by efficiency, I'm really referring to how the how quickly the browser can analyze the change that has happened to the DOM and update what's painted on the screen as a result, how quickly it can do that, how performantly it can do it. And it was kind of determined by our JavaScript code that we wrote and the kind of changes that we made uh, programmatically to the DOM, again, based on the user kind of triggered by the user interacting with the page. So as a developer, you had to build up your knowledge of what were considered good practices and bad practices in relation to DOM manipulation. And what the React uh, design team kind of asked themselves was, should we assume that all developers are fully au fait with what the good DOM manipulation practices are? And they came to the conclusion that perhaps not. It would be better maybe if we could take that kind of decision-making away from the developer and let the React runtime engine take care of it for them. And the way they achieve that is by introducing this notion of the virtual DOM. So what happens now is when, um, when a React app is loaded initially into the browser, what React does is it constructs a, an ob a, a JavaScript object network itself called the virtual DOM. And that virtual DOM is a mirror of the real DOM. The browser still constructs the real DOM, but React has its own kind of version of that, which we call the virtual DOM. And the virtual DOM data structure is a much more efficient data structure than the browser's old DOM structure. And as you then, as the user then interacts with the app, uh, the interaction is going to cause changes to happen to the virtual DOM. What the, what the React runtime does then is it analyzes the changes that have happened to the virtual DOM. It essentially kind of compares the current instantiation of the virtual DOM versus the previous instantiation. There's a diff operation. And the output of that diff operation, it then uses that output or that diff output to work out what changes should be applied to the real DOM, the browser's own DOM but it carries out those changes in a much more efficient way because it's programmatically designed to do that. The, the React design team implemented all of this themselves within the React runtime engine. And as before then, so, so the React runtime engine, it's now taking care of updating the browser's own DOM, which I'm calling the real DOM. And of course, as before, if the real DOM changes, then the, the browser will automatically repaint the screen. So the, the code that we write, all of these components that we write, uh, when a component re-renders, the re-rendering is gonna cause changes to happen to the virtual DOM data structure. And at the end of a complete re-rendering cycle, uh, certain changes have been made to the virtual DOM the React Runtime Engine can compute what those changes uh, were, and then it will use those changes to apply the necessary updates to the real DOM. And as I said, the browser then takes care of the rest. The browser takes care of um, changing what appears on the screen. So um, 
that's what actually kind of is happening behind the scenes. Okay, creates this lightweight, uh, efficient form of the real DOM itself, uh, which we call the virtual DOM. And then your app changes the virtual DOM. So I know for reading it, but uh, and the, the the virtual DOM is changed via your components. In other words, what the component returns, the JSX that it returns, and the JSX that it returns may change from one rendering of the component to the next rendering. And of course that change is gonna be applied to the virtual DOM and it will ripple on to the real DOM. And then the React engine, as I said, does the rest. I don't want to really be reading this because you can read it yourselves. The net effect, uh, uh, the benefit of all of this, of introducing this virtual DOM into the whole equation was that as developers, the code that we wrote was much cleaner and more maintainable. And you're gonna to have to take it from me that when we were developing browser-based apps pre any of these single page app framework days, the sheer volume of code that we had to write uh, and the structure or lack of structure in the code really was quite difficult from a maintenance point of view. So we do, uh, our coding now is much cleaner uh, more maintainable and easier to read. And as well, because the React runtime engine, it takes care of updating the real DOM in, a, in an optimized kind of efficient way, then that means that the performance of our app from the normal user's perspective is much better. They don't get that kind of jagged uh, user experience as the app is changing what it wants to display on the screen. So this is a kind of a fuller uh, detail then of what actually happens behind the scenes when all of this, with this virtual DOM as part of the equation. So if we go back to the very first little simple counter component that we had, okay, just a single component on its own. What's, what's different now is what's happening down here. Okay, so the user clicks the, clicks the button as we remember, the on-click handler, executes, it changes the state variable, the component re-renders. Uh, that means the re-rendering has changed, carried out some change on the virtual DOM. Okay, so the component re-renders, re-executes or re-renders. Uh, the virtual DOM has changed. Everything's inside the red now is really taken care of by the runtime, the React runtime engine. React then does a diff operation between the current and previous state of the virtual DOM. So it really has kind of two copies of this virtual DOM data structure. The, the version that existed before my component re-rendered and the version after the component has re-rendered does a diff operation and then uh, updates the real DOM as a result. And then the browser paints the screen. This is what's happening in relation to our filter friends list app. And again, you know, there's a lot going on here behind the scenes, but all of the um, all of the items within that red box there is taken care of by the React runtime engine. And there are this there's this kind of vocabulary we talk about the the pre-commit phase and the commit phase, the pre-commit phase of the runtime engines. Uh, execution flow is essentially before it has committed any changes to the real DOM. So up here is where it's computing the difference between the current virtual DOM and the previous virtual DOM, computes all of those changes. Um, that's what we call in its pre-commit phase. And then it applies those changes to the actual browser's DOM. And that is what we refer to as the commit phase of this whole flow. And really once that happens at that stage, React is out of the equation. It has made changes to the browser's DOM. Then the browser itself, it takes care of this part here as we had from before. You kind of don't really need to worry about the virtual DOM. It's one of those things in the background. Uh, you never need to really concern yourself about it unless you're talking about a very, very large app and you really are trying to fine tune the performance of the app from, from normal user's perspective, then you may need to have some awareness of what's actually happening inside here. 
but that is very, very rare. The whole point of it is um, that you don't have to worry about all of this dumb manipulation stuff that's happening behind the scenes. You just write your components uh, with your event handlers and your state variables, et cetera, et cetera, and the React runtime takes care of the rest for you. The other term that you may come across if you read about this is they talk about the reconciliation phase uh, and the reconciliation phase is where React is working out what has changed in the virtual DOM after it has re-rendered each component in the hierarchy as a result of one user interaction. So uh, I've covered a lot. Uh, <laughs> I'm happy that I've covered it, but hopefully it has made sense to you. Uh, and again, maybe revisit the video or different parts of it if you need to. And definitely you need to play with that, the two sample apps, as well as doing the, the lab, obviously. So uh, we've talked about state variables. We've talked about the whole notion of side effects uh, and how we implement side effects. And we've talked about data flow within an app. So these are the core parts of the React component model, as I uh, which is the purpose of this lecture. And at the very end, then, I just briefly spoke about the virtual DOM, which, as I kind of say, is something you really don't need to worry yourself about too much. You may see references to it in error messages that are coming back at runtime, so you can make sense of it in that sense, or you can relate to it in that sense, but other than that, uh, you kind of ignore it, essentially. So anyway, uh, back to here. And if I go here, yeah, so in the lab itself, then you are rolling out this uh, movies app, as I call it. So I'm just showing you some screenshots, which we will eventually get to. You won't get to this stage in this week, no. So here are some various screenshots from the app. And we will be building up that uh, over the next four weeks. All right, uh, I'm done. I don't know if there are any closing questions that people might have. No. Is there any interim sub submission in between? Uh, no, so the way, yeah, it's a good question actually. So uh, maybe, so we're at week, uh, this is week four, isn't it? Yeah, I think this is week four, yeah. So I think maybe by week six, I will be able to give you the specification for the first assignment. And really the first assignment is going to be take the app that you have been rolling out in the labs and then build on it. And I'll give you some uh, guidelines as to what we would like you to consider. And we give you a kind of a grading spectrum. And so what, you, what the grading spectrum will do is tell you, well, if you want to get between 40 and 55, this is what you need to achieve. If you want to get between 55 and 70, this is what you need to do, that kind of idea. That's what I mean by a grading spectrum. So in terms of submissions, you won't actually be submitting that assignment until about week 12, believe it or not. The second assignment, which Frank will give you, he will specify what he's looking for probably around week 10 or maybe 11. Uh, and you will be submitting it further down the line again after that, maybe around week 15-ish. Um, so that's kind of the plan. You know, I could give you a specification for the assignment today, but you can't really do anything until you have worked your way through the... Uh, evolving of this movies app within the labs. That's that's the plan. That's what we've done for the last number of years. It's worked out okay, I think. So the first submission, which is, I think was really your question, the first submission probably won't be until around week uh, 12. Okay, okay, yeah. perfect. Great. Anything else? Right, uh, so I'll touch base with G again on Thursday and you've got plenty to work on now between now and then really. So have fun, talk to you later.